I have this weird memories of being really young and getting a music, magical musical machine it was called. It was this horrible thing. It was about this long and it just had these buttons on it and it was really electronic sounding and you could just make the, you could kind of run your fingers all over it and do these weird melodies. Really synthetic sound. And I remember just being able to get lost in it, you know, like, oh, you can just go for hours making this horrific noise. And the other thing was a, um, I think the other thing was a, was sitting at home on the piano and looking at the bookshelf and having all the spines of these books and National Geographic magazines and playing the book titles. And they had this one on angelfish, a National Geographic magazine about these fish that don't see the light. They have luminous bones and they have this protruding, glowing bone that attracts fish to them. And I remember just playing it on the piano and really freaking myself out with all these dark colours down the bottom, making this really ominous stuff. And uh, yeah, it's a pure improvisation to the, as a response to these sort of worlds that you saw somewhere else and thinking, um, yeah, it never seemed to pose a problem that you could, you could take music and just channel it, make it your own, put out your own feeling about something you saw around you. It always seemed like it was pretty easy too, music. It was like, oh yeah, oh that tune, oh yeah, that goes like that, or, oh, oh I can remember how that one goes, or it was quite a, um, it felt natural, it felt totally like a simple natural thing to do. I think those were the things that made me go, oh this is something for me. That would have been maybe six or seven, I think, when it was when I was playing my uh, magnum opus to the National Geographic spines was probably an age around then. And I remember as well tone, like being really. I had this little guitar that was a steel string guitar. I don't know if it was meant to be a steel string guitar, but I just remember it had this really bright, clear sound. And then afterwards playing other people's guitars and I was like, oh, I don't like the, I don't like the tone of that one or being, and then hearing other pianos like, oh, this one's really dull and this one's really bright and this one's got this richness that I really like. And I think noticing also walls when you like, uh, when you drum on a wall wow, this wall sounds really good and this one doesn't. And Someone had like a pressed tin wall, I think, at their house. And I remember playing it, probably driving my mum up the wall, but just playing this, playing this sound and this rhythm. And there was a really, oh, this is the place where it sounds really good. And car seats as well, you could hit them and they, they had this really bass boom to them because the, the closed in box of the car and the big sort of taut drum of the, the seat. And I remember learning Chariots of Fire and going and playing it on the piano at school and these kids were like, oh well, that's that song we know and you could play it and it was so simple. And someone's saying, do you want me to play the accompaniment bit to it? And I was like, no. I don't, I don't want you to do that at all, I just want to keep doing it. And so I think the first time I realised, oh there's a thing you do together was with a band and we, I, we had a punk band and there was like three of us and I'd heard, I'd seen the documentary on punk music and thought, fuck that's amazing. And so we started to try and do these songs, Dead Kennedy songs and Sex Pistol songs, Anti Nowhere League and we were getting it all ready for the school dance that we were going to have, trying to figure out how to get around the teachers to be able to play some of these songs. And then we were practicing and it was like, no, it doesn't go like that, it goes like this. We we're kind of doing that thing where you figure out how the song goes. And then we started to play it and it just took off and the drums were going, the guitar was going, it was all meshed in together into this sound and we, it was 
almost too much like we almost had to stop playing because it was so it was such a moment of power of fuck it's all come together this is how it's done you know this is how bands play and that was great that was a real lights on epiphany of the alchemy of musicians and what happens when they come together and how they the sum is greater than the parts you know that was a really great moment so I guess I was probably 13 or 14 maybe when when we did that I had a friend I guess this was the first time I really connected in with New Zealand contemporary music was this friend of mine uh, won three passes he figured out how to ring up the radio station in a lightning flash so he just aced these kind of uh, competitions they would have and he won three passes to orientation week so we were too young to drive or we kind of snuck out every night but he would I don't know how he did it somehow he advertised the fact that he had a pass I think it might have been back on ODU and he said he would uh, he could get somebody in who could give us a ride to orientation week so me and him went and we got a ride from some guy called Ian I think his name was and um, we just went the whole we sort of snuck out every night and went to see I think we saw Chris Knox do a solo show we saw Headless Chickens we saw Belter Space and we saw Snapper and we saw the Go-Betweens were there they came over and we saw the John Paul Sartre experience I think it just seemed like we saw everybody in this week of who was really really working in this fruitful lush time of New Zealand alternative rock and roll and it just kind of totally opened my eyes to what was around instead of you know being into some pretty dodgy stuff but I don't know I guess I was interested really in that pop scene new romantic scene that was fascinating for me and then started to get into this darker um, metal scene and, and a whole lot of the flavours that sort of has in it that I found really intriguing too then this whole local thing of real wow it's all happening now these people are down the road and they live there and it's all what it's our flavour of New Zealand music that was really uh, yeah that was like something I hadn't experienced before so much and I think after that it led me into other other areas of contemporary music that weren't so commercial like looking into the um, human music compilation and then discovering Big Black and um, Sonic Youth were still kind of underground at that stage and then yeah just starting to look into some a bit a bit less obvious musical avenues that was really that was relatable too and Gigi Allen like wow this is great this stuff and it sort of had that connection back to that punk thing that sort of hooked me right at the beginning but on some other level you know this was really really localized gritty stuff going on it wasn't it didn't it didn't kind of have the posturing and it didn't have the uh, the angsty flavor it had something quite I don't know more pointed and more sharp and much more carnival in a way I guess that started to come into it as well it had the the dramatics definitely going on Then my father said he was going to, he, him and my mother had split up by this stage, so he was, he was looking, he found work in Australia, in, uh, in Melbourne, and his mother lived there, so he said to me, you should come and finish school off there, have a fresh start, sort of thing. 
and um, he said, you'll have to really, you know, pull finger and do well. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. I just didn't seem like I couldn't do well in those days. I would try really hard and it just all went to shit all the time. So no matter what I did, it, it just, uh, it was trouble. And then I went to Melbourne and um, tried to finish school there, but it, I'd kind of missed out about a year and a half of high school. So it was hard to pick it up at a, they had a HSC high school certificate in those days. Well, they called it HSC. And I was, it just was, it was just out of my reach. I didn't, you know. So um, I sort of staggered through that and yeah, I really missed uh, the community of friends I'd had in Christchurch. I remember it being really, really hard to sort of find. I mean, the people were lovely in the school in Melbourne, but it just wasn't lifelong friends like I'd grown up with in Christchurch. And I remember playing a bit of guitar over there, stuff, and people, people were like, "Oh, wow, you can you can do that." And, I don't know, you just don't think of it, you think of it as something you just enjoy and don't take it that seriously. But someone would say, oh, you want to play in a band? You want to do this? And I was like, oh, okay. And I think I was there for about a year and then uh, came back to came back to New Zealand and then um, was around in New Zealand for about another, I don't know, it's a really short time. I think it was about eight months, but it might have been a wee bit longer. It might have been another year or so and then I went back to Melbourne so the time I spent back in New Zealand was in Christchurch and I was working in kitchens and uh, just being a young dude doing hospitality work and all the drinking and fun that goes with that and that was another time I remember not doing a lot of music but going to a party and someone there was a band playing and I sort of somehow ended up playing the guitar and the friends of mine at the time were really like oh you can do that I didn't realize that was something you did and it was uh I've had moments like that quite a few times in my life one was in Thailand when I was I had a tour with some tour guide and we went and uh at the end of the tour we went and ate something together and we were going through this big sort of store and there was a guitar shop and I went in and started to play a guitar and she said, oh, you really love to play the guitar. And that was bizarre because no one had ever seen that side of it before. They just go, oh, you can do that or oh, that's something you do or whatever. But no one had ever said, oh, you really love to do it. And that was such a different way of looking at it for me. But anyway, I, so then I went and moved back to Melbourne in the early 90s and then I started playing music with some people in a band. We had this sort of Tom Waits cover band that ended up somehow segueing into this kind of almost like a Rolling Stones band. But I was, I was the drummer in that, so it was a really different thing for me to get used to. We turned up to the first gig and I thought I was going to play the bass. And they said, they got me to set up the drum kit and I was like trying to figure out how it all went together. And Okay, oh, I got it set up thinking someone else was going to play it. And they're like, no, you're going to play it now. And it's like, oh, okay. So that was the first gig. That was the first time really of drumming was trying to figure it out on stage. And I think a lot of music's like that. A lot of it's just people falling into this role somehow accidentally or blagging their way through to this point where they, they kind of have to do it. It's pretty funny. It's almost like a like it's a requirement of of doing music is that you can accidentally get your way through, you know. I had a lot of kitchen hand work in different various places and working in sandwich bars, working in nightclubs, working in general pubs, churning out roast meals for old diggers and stuff like that. And then I started to do a lot of caregiving work and that really opened my eyes in another way from being, hospitality is all about 
quantity and speed and pressure and caregiving work actually almost should be called hospitality because it's more true sense of the word but it, um, it's about taking your time and caring and making sure someone's comfortable and that seemed like the opposite to all the kitchen work I'd done so I worked for about three or four different agencies and I could make up my roster as I wanted so I could I could take a two hour job on Thursday morning starting at five and going till seven and then I could have a couple of hours off and then in the afternoon I could do some more stuff and and I could find a night shift here and so this whole weird itinerant making up your own schedule thing kind of came out of that and I was doing a lot of visual art at the time so I was doing oil painting and printmaking and that kind of gave me the space to get exhibitions together and show show work and and develop that side of things and for a, quite a while it seemed like music just sort of went and sat down in the background somewhere and I listened to a lot of it but I didn't I didn't make so much at that time I mean I, I always kept it as a constant thing there was a friend of mine in Melbourne Stuart Thomas and he he was a really constant musical I don't, I don't know, he was a companion, he was a collaborator, but he was also something about his approach. I just remember watching him sitting down and he would have just a guitar and he would just be working things out on it. And he would be working out a song he didn't know or he'd be playing a song he knew that he was trying to find new ways around in it. And he was always always exploring and always looking further. And that, in that same way that that other friend of mine, Damien Jones, had done that with musical taste this guy did with musical playing and it was always just so uh, inspiring to see someone just looking looking further and always looking further and trying to trying to push things in different directions so we played we did a lot of four track recording and demoing and uh, just trying out a lot of experimental recording stuff like um using answer machines on telephones as recording devices and building up this crazy kind of a world of overdubbing and looping and that was uh i remember just the excitement like just all night long doing this really strange music and getting in this bizarre worlds of where that can lead you so we did a lot of that we played a lot of live gigs I played bass mainly in those days. I don't know how I did it because now when I look at the bass guitar, it's so hard. I can't. It's one of the instruments I find really. It's invisible what a bass player does. It's such this magic thing that they can do. And I try it, and I'm like, oh yeah, this this is kind of working. And then I see an actual bass player doing it, and I'm like, okay, wow, that's really that's what it's meant to be like. So um, we did these nights at uh. At a, at a hard and fast nightclub really like heavy rock and we had this little weird chill out room that we'd play these strange gigs and just try and freak out the the bogans I think was what we were trying to do playing a lot of weird African rhythms and strange um, dark noir kind of things that we'd, we'd been working on that was cool I remember really just the freedom of it, like being paid to have this gig once a week that you could just do the weirdest stuff. It was really great. And it was, it was playful too with them. There was a lot of, yeah, development and looking for ways to do things that you hadn't done them before. And then I moved back to, I moved back to New Zealand in about 98, I think that was and moved to Auckland and I started to um, I started to sing and play the guitar because like to go back to the guitar felt really natural but I didn't have a band to play with anymore so I had to be the source of the music and singing seemed like a huge part of that I remember talking to this guy and saying how do you do it how do you get into it and he said, oh, just try and get in a band as a backup singer. And, and after that, you can 
you know, that'll sort of get you used to it and then you can start to develop it more from there. And I got a, got a gig for some guy's party because we went, we went and had a camp with the place I was working at and I took a guitar along and we sort of played songs around the fire and he really liked this and he wanted to have a party that was like that so we put together this Hank Williams band and sort of dragged all these country players together out of nowhere and had it up on top of this apartment building in K Road and sort of made it look like a hacienda and I got this um, pedal steel guitar player to come who just about killed himself getting up to the top of the building. He just wanted to drink like two litres of Coca-Cola. And as, uh, he started running up the stairs and the handle came out of the trolley that his pedal steel was on and it just went clonk, clonk, clonk all the way down the stairs and we just felt horrified. And, we'll take that, don't worry, you just get yourself up to the top of the building. So he did and he was just puffing and wheezing and we thought what have we done and then we all set up and he started to play and we were like wow this is this sounds great you know so it was pretty probably a horrible gig but it was a dream for us or for me and so we just had this kind of um yeah this country band that appeared out of nowhere and then I went down to Papakura and played in the country music competition which was pretty funny I've got these notes about needs to needs to open his eyes more and address the audience you know classic marks on performance and um but that was sort of how the singing came into it the singing was just born out of desperation and necessity so always there's this feeling with me when I'm singing that it's still kind of this new thing that I'm doing and it wasn't it wasn't trained and it's always a bit shaky and I always kind of hear oh, that could be <laughs> that could be a bit better but I don't know people try all sorts of different approaches to singing and tonally I, I have some pretty loose uh, benchmarks there with what is in tune and what isn't and I think a lot about these microtonal things and the idea that perfectly in tune is that I think it's the Indonesians they talk about when things are in tune too in tune there's nothing for the spirits to catch onto in the music so it died, the music dies and it becomes dead and I think that's a lot of it for me like listening to listening to people singing and hearing what's in tune and what's out of tune some of these amazing old um, horn sections in this old ska music is so out of tune but that's what's beautiful about it is that it it has this other feeling that's not perfectly in tune. Perfectly in tune can be really useful as well. And it can hit a part of you that nothing else can access. But it's, yeah, it's a bit, maybe it's overrated. Usually it was, I, I liked the recording and I would try and emulate what I heard in the recording. So for, Hank Williams, there was a, so many recordings of different stuff that he did, and there was this one song, A Teardrop on a Rose, and it, it was a pretty shitty song. It was pretty schmaltzy, it's about a guy going into a garden and he sees a teardrop on a rose and that symbolises how he's feeling, and it was really... When I tried to sing it, I realised how it wasn't the strongest song in the world, but something about the recording, and the way he sang really got me and it was a it was the warmth and the microphone sound and it was the, the sort of the reverb that he had on the voice that really gave him these really long notes and he sang specifically for that sound like it wasn't like he sang it the normal way he sings and then they put the reverb on afterwards it was like that's how he heard it and he really delivered it into that environment and I noticed that tripped me up quite a few times was I I would hear a recording and think, wow, that's really, I want to do that. But then I realised, oh, the song isn't, it's not the song doing that, it's something else. So then I started to think about, I guess that led me into the idea that songs, you can take them wherever you want. And that 
was definitely opened up in my mind by this how radical the Johnny Cash's American recording series that came out by Rick Rubin seemed at the time now it's people just it's so logical and so obvious but this idea that you take a song and you deliver it really a different way was quite novel to it seemed to be novel to me at least and definitely it took other people by surprise as well and that was kind of a revelation in a way to see here like I just remember how amazed people were that he did a sound garden song and then he did a nine inch nails song and um, yeah that was a moment when you realize wow take songs where you want and that brought brought about some full circle as well of the idea of the songwriter as a different person to the singer and that's something that keeps getting stronger and stronger in my mind and I'm sure that's something it's not just limited to me but the whole musical comprehension we have as people will st will take that on stronger too and we will have artists who just interpret songs again and they don't write them we already do but um, in a much more secretive way that you would look up who actually wrote that Adele song and realize oh it wasn't her what a surprise but do do most people know that whereas with Frank Sinatra it was totally obvious that Here's a, and, and Billie Holiday and these artists that they delivered, they didn't create. They, they, they created their own interpretation of something, but they didn't, they hadn't, uh, they hadn't written the song. And I think, um, yeah, the interpretation idea led me pretty clearly into the path I feel like I'm quite strongly on now with, um, Definitely the way I see musical ownership and influence is something not to try and hide or disguise or anything. It's something just just let it all go in the same direction. And yeah, that's that that's a contextual thing too, because whenever I go to whenever I perform in Europe I get a really different response than when I perform in the States. And one thing that keeps striking me about performing in the USA is people think what's this music and w that you do and how does how is it how did you make it and where does it come from and that blows me away because to me it's American roots music blues country based stuff folk music there's a there's a heavy European folk influence in there too but to them it doesn't sound like American music and so then I'm like well what is that sound to you because it's not the chords and it's not the lyrics and then maybe it's a um, oh, like a production value or something that they they're used to hearing country music that sounds like this so yeah that's something that often gets me by surprise well the move to Switzerland was um, I was married, so me and my wife, we wanted to move to Switzerland because that's where she came from. And Bern was where her father lived. So we moved there and the idea was to get a bit more of a taste of the world. But uh, little did I realize there was the Voodoo Rhythm Records family community was based in Bern. And that was, uh, that was amazing because that was such a look for me at again another whole world of music that I kind of hadn't figured out before and this ex the extremeness of the recordings and the really overdriven attitude towards 129 percent you know Reverend Beatman Creed all that stuff it just became yeah it became so it was I just gravitated completely towards it and then started to sort of work with the people who were uh, involved in that label and then joined the Dead Brothers as a drummer and started to once once we sort of we sort of had a bit of a shaky lineup I had people coming and going but then it settled into this four 
person lineup, and that that produced about two two albums that were really succinct and had this beautiful kind of flavour. Somehow the Americana meeting with uh, European folk music, and that was. Um, I think there the drums kind of bled, blurred into lap steel guitar, trombone, singing, songwriting, all this. Everyone just started putting stuff in and these these albums came out of that. And um, I started also working with a lot of other bands in Voodoo Rhythm Records and did guest spots with these guys and helped out here and there with lots of stuff. And just watching the way Beatman worked as this kind of one man powerhouse of design, uh, production, songwriting, performing, and also the way he could facilitate other people's uh, albums and and keep a label going it was just, yeah, totally another one of these people you see, you're just like, wow, it's hugely inspiring to see somebody just kicking out along at that kind of rate. I think he was putting out one album a month for a while, just going like hell, you know, and I really like that input. I remember talking to another really good friend of mine and he said, we were talking about the Stones and he was saying, yeah man, I mean, these guys, they put out an album every six months. And I just thought, that's fucking great. Why, why aren't we doing that? And the reason we aren't doing that is because people are worried about marketing and saturating the market. Again, it's that thing of money dictating the flow of the energy and it's just wrong. It shouldn't be like that. So I've tried to, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that too, especially in this uh, time we live in now of digital release and wondering if my idea of the album is outdated and I should be not so fixated on a 45 roughly minute collection of songs, a body of work in that format. Should I think about EPs? Should I think about singles? Probably I should, but... um. I don't know, the album idea is still irresistible somehow to me. It's such a beautiful length. So, I mean, that's one way to get around this idea of uh, over oversaturating or, or worrying about a market release like that would be to just start, start churning out an EP every four months or something like that. And the idea of working on four songs at once is quite appealing. Always with an album, there's a couple of things you're like, oh, should that really be there? Or, but those are the little unwanted siblings that somehow give it the family vibe, you know? It's not going to be all pure. It has to have the runt part of the litter, you know? And I remember saying this thing to myself, okay, if there's ever going to be a choice between anything, just choose music. That's, that's the way to do it, streamline it down like that. And that means you lose a lot and you gain a lot and it simplifies the thing down. So it seemed like that became my way of operating and I just did it that way. I'm not sure if it was um, that sensible. And I'm sure I could have done a better business model for myself, but I mean, for me, it was still, and then it was, and is still heavily about just being immersed in the in the in the music, finding finding where it takes you, and and being there to enjoy it. Someone had a loop machine at the studio I was at, and they were like, "Oh, I think it was a it was a delay simulator, tape delay simulator." And I was curious about it, and they kind of showed me how to do it. And I just remember it was, wow, it was like with that punk band when Anarchy in the UK took off with the three of us. It was kind of like that. It was like, this is this is great. So suddenly, it, all the experience of drumming, guitar playing, singing, all that stuff that I'd done before just all gelled together in this moment. And I just remember like playing something, just about 20 minutes of this loop thing and then realizing the possibilities on the guitar and what that could do. Uh, so I did a lot, I just booked these tours all over Europe doing that and I, I toured on the train 
Um, I would be probably writing songs on the train and then I would get to the uh, town I was going to and I would get covers printed up on the copy shop at the station, burn off CD compilations of demos I'd made during the sound check, package them up, sell them after the show and um, just had this kind of rolling lifestyle where everything seemed like it was tied into the songwriting and, and the music. And um, then through doing that I slowly started to figure my way into um, a, a bass octave so that the the percussion side of what I was playing on the guitar could be maximised and then playing through a guitar amp and a bass amp so splitting the signal and using the top the guitar amp for all the highs and the bottom amp for all the lows so then there was no prioritisation of the amp and you could have each one doing exactly what they're meant to do and the sound was really full it didn't drop away and then the bullet mic came into play and then all these little things just started to add together to this uh, really uh, holistic kind of a little machine that it could do so much stuff and then yeah just refining things over the years with using the PA as the base system so I, the last tour I did I just had a little Vox Pathfinder and a DI and just used the base in the PA as the grunty rhythm side and that was I mean that's so minimal that way so that was um yeah that was sort of like this blueprint somehow of how to strip everything back to this one person and just go for it each, each night's different each night's totally adaptable to where you're at yeah that was um kind of my I always saw the Dead Brothers after that. I kind of looked at the Dead Brothers as the apprenticeship or the post, post-school post educational... That was my tertiary period, was those three years with those guys, and then I graduated on to doing my own stuff after that. And some guy, he saw me, he goes, you've really you maximised your shit, man. Like everything was so functional and each thing had its purpose and it was, uh, it was really nice to just go, yeah, fuck it. It's at that point where it's each thing is essential. And Working with Marlon was great because it had this kind of, I always had this feeling of possibility and had this uh, it had this great competitive kind of a tug of war between these this shining the cliched idea the shining youth and the older decrepit flavor you know naivety versus world weariness and this constant backwards and forward that it could do that was um it was also good because I think somewhere it felt like Marlon's made that decision that I had made as well that okay this is it it's music that's that's what it's about for us so you had that feeling that oh this is that's what's important you know and that was really nice to have a collaborator that had that same kind of focus or that intense relationship with music Tammy's someone else who uh, I think working with her it was great the sort of the robust positivity she brings and I definitely remember first starting to work with her it felt like whoa there's some fun on the stage and that really changed um, changed things around like she's she's got an infectious enjoyment of stuff that's really really great she's also great to write with you know like we producing that album of hers um, the first one there was <clears throat> there was some quite big gaps in the song list that we needed and we just 
wrote like about three three of these songs in one afternoon. They just were like, bam. And as soon as they were, were written, we were recording them 20 minutes later in the studio, still kind of writing them. And that was really exciting, just to, the pace that happened. That was really, um, yeah. She was, she's, she's a great collaborator to work with. I remember we did this show in Devonport together um, with Marlon and me and her and she we thought let's do some covers and she suggested some songs like Jackson and I can't remember these songs and I just just thought no way that's not that's too boring that's too obvious we should find some like singer Otis Redding song and uh started to tr change it to try and get her to do you'll never walk alone you know like classic torch songs and taking it away from the the country vibe into something bigger and more open to interpretation and something that lets you stretch out as a singer as well because she's just got she needs that space to stretch into and um i think she kind of well, that was the moment she went wow you you kind of get what I'm about and I remember thinking why why isn't that what you present to people because that's that's the true uh, that's somehow that's what that's that's what you want to be showcasing is that side of what you do and I hadn't seen it till then it didn't seem like that was that was sort of what was on offer but it seemed like the logical way to go I often think about that with production because I think, I think it's about seeing, seeing the essence you think or a side that you think hasn't been seen, and then um, bringing that into the light, fo focusing the light on that, showing that facet of that person. I think with a lot of self-production, and I know I've fallen in the trap myself, is you you just can't see what someone who's not busy can see. And I definitely remember recording with Tammy's album. There was times when the band was playing and they they were just kind of messing around the, with the rough idea of the song and they they had it. And so we sort of, me and Ben Edwards were like, just record that. Yeah, cool. And sitting there talking and then, ah, they go, fuck man, we just don't have it. This is bullshit. Fuck the song. And you're like, just keep moving, just do something else. And then later on, after that day, going, that was that song. And they're like, wow that's it you know that that is the vibe that is the feeling that's the groove so that was really um for me that was a massive eye opener and i was really grateful for tammy to ask me to do that and give me that opportunity to be not one of the players but one listening and this um it's interesting that because i always had this feeling like i feel like i'm not doing anything i feel lazy i feel like i'm and a charlatan I'm in the wrong place um, you know all this stuff and then afterwards you go oh there's no way that would have sounded like that without someone who just was hands off and just thinking and listening and trying to find it so it's I think production's a really interesting area for that because it's so much about the esoterics of songwriting arrangement uh, how you record it all that stuff becomes really really important and it's um yeah, it's a, it's a strange narrow path to walk because you're not the engineer and you're not a musician. You're somewhere sort of going between these two worlds and trying to connect them but trying to also find a way to get the right current flowing between them. I've found now I can nearly listen to anything and go, oh, I can hear what my touch would do to that, you know? And that's... That's interesting. Sometimes things are, you don't want to put that in there and obviously you still enjoy things, but you can always click that part of yourself on where you think, yeah, I would have done it this way. Or Manasta Chango is the project me and my partner Nicole have, and that's... um. It's kind of like her flavors blended with my flavors. So there's a lot of this Spanish cumbia and definitely the whole 
world her singing brings and then there's my um sort of looping there's a bit of that there's song songwriting stuff from me it's hard to find a balance with that because it's it's not so much um it's not my song it is it is my songs but it's not purely my songs and so we often have to find the way to take the songs forward both at the same time so it's not just me going oh yeah there's 10 more songs and we could do these and it's like yeah sure we could but that's not really what that project's about and one thing we did want to keep open with this project is the idea of playfulness and exploration so um, we we're always looking for uh, possibilities to collaborate with um, with hip hop for example or with mariachi bands or uh, fuller extended rhythm sections things like that those are what we want to explore with it and uh, we, we wanted it to be kind of light but at the same time serious and um, have this playful upbeat thing but be a bit sort of menacing at the same time so we're still exploring a lot of that we're um, yeah there's a lot of stuff I've tried to free up from to um, be able to take that musical step started trying to write some rap lyrics and just really opening up ideas of how I how I work music wise which is it's great you know any challenge like that's always it's going to bring some laughs at the at the very least yeah. it sometimes feels like one hand like holding the handbrake on and the accelerator at the same time because you you're trying to figure out how to motivate it and push it but how not to dominate it too much it's quite a delicate game but it's brought some real um it's I, I guess it's another one of those projects that's brought about a change musically for me and that feels nice to look look further into um animation on stage and some the idea of it being upbeat and groovy something to dance to and that definitely comes out of the. Um, it's a combination of that that sort of chunkier blues thing and the the Mexican rhythm combined with this sort of cumbia flavour from Brazil. The other thing is just working with somebody else is different because if you're by yourself and you write a song about poor old me, you kind of can get away with it. But if you're doing it with some, someone else, you'll the other person will be like. What the fuck's that shit, man? What are you talking? You know, so it's good to have a someone to drag you out of your own sort of quagmire. I think I do that for her, and I think she does that for me too. Musically, there's times we try and lighten it up because it's a bit. It can get a bit on the heavy side. It still feels like that's such an untapped, or just a barely scratched surface that we're starting to get into, and we've had uh, I've had some talks with Beatman in Switzerland about a movie we want to make and then doing this Black Rider performance recently I started to go mm, I think this maybe this movie should be a musical in a, a darker form of what that would mean so the, the graphic side of it I mean for me it's always been a question or an issue I'd never liked seeing a band get up with tracksuit trousers and running shoes on or whatever I always preferred it to see somebody who's dressed for the show and you're like okay that's that's a big side of what they're presenting is the formal side of it and the the idea that there's a musician's uniform which is a suit you know it's that's um I like that idea it takes it to the music to this classic sort of form but then there's this other side that we started to look into with Manas del Chango where it's urban so maybe there's a song in a tracksuit which is not what I would have ever imagined but somehow that's that suddenly brings a whole new world into my aesthetic language you know and that's that's a great thing it brings it's got so much in it just the idea of a tracksuit it could be urban London it could be Eastern Europe it could be anywhere you know this the idea of what that brings that kind of a uniform as opposed to the the tie the shirt button-down collar all that stuff that I 
generally tend to wear. And maybe it's also a, um, a hark back to a much younger mentality than I'm generally playing, having being of a certain age and having a certain kind of a um, era in my aesthetic. This is definitely a new, a new flavour there. I always think about this idea with tango dancing. You have, you have your arms here, and then you have this hand up here, and the person you're dancing with is meant to keep up quite a strong pressure, so you can read each other, and that's where you go. Now I'm going to go this way. Come back this way with me. This way you can. That and the hand on the back is how you kind of steer the person around. But if they don't keep up that pressure with you, it's like. You don't have the relation there that you want and collaboration should be like this and definitely on stage you can see some people who when they have a collaborator they pick up and they step into this other world and when they're on stage by themselves they get a bit flaccid and they lose the uh they lose that relationship and they, they sprawl somehow I mean, ultimately, the best idea would be to collaborate with the audience because then you have that intense idea of where I end and you begin, but we're playing with that idea and we, we are moving that with a pressure between us that makes us feel like we have a relationship together. When the Dead Brothers are kind of together, I oh, know they were together then. We played the Three Penny Opera in ba in the Staatstheater in, in Basel, and that was that was uh, obviously that's a musical. So that was that's big theatre. So that's the classic Basel uh, dramatic theatre they have there, and that was that was amazing. Like just to work for such a big institution and to be stuck in these warrens under the stages of which rehearsal rooms we're in and onto the stage off the stage that was great and um that had quite a long season that had about three months i think and uh we would sort of disperse we did a quite a heavily intensive maybe six week rehearsal period to start off and then we had the three month season that kind of came and went so they would have a week on and then um, time off and then three days here and so this sort of these musicians would all sort of turn up to Basel and have another couple of shows and then disperse and then come back together and that was really nice and that's a great part about theatre work is, is the ensemble you build and the, the dynamics of a new group of people who are excited to get to know each other and enjoy what they discover and and enjoying time together because you've done the rehearsals, you know each other well, and then you go away and have your own life, and then you'll come back together, and it's like, ah, it's a bit reunion flavor that can be really nice. So that was that was a really, really great experience for me. Um, I did a couple of theater shows in Bern in Switzerland, and they were more, much smaller scale, but still very, very highly focused. And they were also still playing very musically based, so um, they were yeah not not really getting into the acting world of it. But then this latest Black Rider piece that we've been doing is for me the strongest step out of being a musician and into being an actor and actually playing a role on a stage, singing without an instrument, and delivering dialogue and lines and sometimes just a presence on the stage without the help of a musical instrument at all. And the only other time I did something that dramatic was when I played in a movie. It was the main role in The Road to Nod, which was a jailbird road drama movie that uh, we put together in with slow boat pictures in Frankfurt, Germany. So we tour, we filmed, started in Ireland and then moved down to 
Holland and drove across to Germany filming the whole way. So that was also completely unmusical and just dramatic. But I like this uh, Black Rider thing because it's expressionist acting and so everything's much larger than life and, and you can do a lot. You can ham it up, which is, I think, I love to, I love that side of it because it's it just brings the humour into it and I think humour is a massive side of music. If you can introduce it in a small little thread or as a really something funny, it'll, um, it's this amazing magic that can ease so many situations and translates it into a different, it transcends so many things, humour, it's really, it's really valuable, I don't think uh, it's used as much as it could be and maybe that's why it feels so magical because it's so sparse but you notice when it happens it just can, it can open all these doors that nothing else can go near. I was at the Country Music Awards in Gore and this guy did this song called um, The Mongrel Flogged Me The Mongrel Flogged Me Jumper or The Mongrel Flogged My Jersey and it's a song from a sheep's point of view about being shorn and he played it live and the whole audience was just laughing and really into it and just cheered when he finished the song and it it was it just obviously was such a way to connect everybody up and then other people come out and they sing their songs and they're kind of about love gone wrong or you know it just didn't cut through and just didn't connect in the same way but this guy totally should have won I reckon just you could you could feel it in the audience how powerful it was and it was light it was a light and powerful thing to do and it really connected everybody up but it didn't win the prize that was a shame but humor, I always used to think about humor like if you got in a someone started to threaten you and you got in a heavy situation if you could just make a joke and that would diffuse everything and using humor as a way to disarm people and get closer somehow ultimately that's what you're trying to do you want to you want to get closer and you want to sneak in or you want to open up the doors between people and humor is a really good way to do that it's irresistible and it'll break down the toughest people in a way that they it's like a surprise attack in a way it sneaks up it's hard to pull off because it's so when it goes wrong it's horrible and no one wants to know about it well the the three penny opera that definitely lifted a lot of technical game of mine because you couldn't make noise it wasn't it was a very slick production so I had to get gold plated cables to plug in so they there's no buzz anymore and there was you know this was really like well okay how the hell is this gonna work but somehow it worked and then the other performances and and the music for them is help too because you see this um this whole other way of looking at music that's not song driven it's just sound and the dead brothers did a lot of that like we did this show at the end of every show we did we would go into the crowd and we would do a couple of songs acoustic and one song we did was it's a Marlene Dietrich song and it has a solo in the middle where someone plays a really quiet accordion solo and then whatever noise was happening in the room filled in the spaces and I remember just like turning this ashtray around on a table and it made this screeching kind of a noise and that was the solo was that and a accordion so this sort of stuff suddenly this really intense focus on small noises that's a huge part of the the way theatre music works and the idea as well of theatre music is you, you almost don't want to know what's making the noise so as someone's doing weird sounds on a drum kit as soon as you hear the hi-hat go you're like ah oh, it's a drum kit but the the more the more time you can spend making noise on these things and people don't actually know 
Is that a double bass, or a clarinet, or a cymbal being scraped? What are the hell is that noise? It's just making the atmosphere. That's to me the theatrical side of it, and that's definitely something I build into the live show that I do with some of the songs that get more sonically abstract, and suddenly you're like, what is this environment that's telling a story? And each sound, each sound has a real purpose. It is a character. It is a part of the story, and it comes in to help you develop that picture. I think that's been really um, hugely valuable, and definitely something after my own heart to start to approach music this way. That it it tells stories and its its characters. It's not just. Uh, yeah, anything else almost seems uh, dead in a way. I used to think of distortion as making things louder, but I've come to see it as actually often makes things quieter because you you blur the clarity of something so you don't have such a pointed presence of it anymore. That also makes it porous, which makes it nicer to uh, become part of as a listener. Because in order for you to integrate with things, they have to have some holes in them, otherwise they're just a surface you bounce off. Seeing Del McCurry and his bluegrass band playing out in the middle of a paddock uh, at m sort of midnight out in the sort of quite deep countryside of um, Tennessee at a festival full of tattooed rowdy rednecks and watching them uh, just the, the religious feeling that come over this crowd and the reverence and how they all just totally calmed down and watched the show and that was, yeah, that was a, a mind-blowing thing to see just music and how distilled it can be. This is, this is a family. This is the grandfather, his nephews, his cousin, his son, all playing in this group, playing music that's written around these parts, in this parts, to people who live in these parts. And that was, yeah, that was something else. That was really amazing, especially... Uh, Having sung that song, Get On Your Knees and Pray So Many Times with Marlon, and then hearing hearing Del McCurry playing it, it was like, wow, this is, this is really incredible. I think that show finished and I kind of couldn't even talk anymore. I just had to go and get in the car and drive sort of an hour back to the town I was staying in. Yeah, it was Muddy Roots Festival. That was a really, I mean, they have... Uh, the Melvins played and Bonnie Prince Billy played and all these all these sort of it was a it was a really weird combination for a festival. Fantastic lineup. But a lot of it was harder driven heavy music and these guys just how light it was and how the beautiful way they played, like they just came on and they did a couple of songs and then they said, Right now is usually the time we take requests. Anyone got anything they want to hear? And everyone was like, oh my God, oh, this, this, this. And, and then they did those, and then they got to the point and they said, oh, now we do the gospel songs. And they played these beautiful songs. And yeah, incredible. Great show. It was like a funeral. Like Del McCurry had, um, he, was in, he was all in white, and everybody else in the band was in black. And they were just, just behind him. And yeah, amazing. Great show. That was a revelation. Some revelations happen that they aren't musical based, they're just they just happen. Being given a guitar, that was a big moment. Um, moving back from Melbourne was another junction it felt like because I was moving away from sort of the whole musical uh, thing I had around me, the network that I had, and 
I remember telling Kim Salmon, oh yeah, I'm going to move back to New Zealand. He just looked at me like, what the fuck? You know, like things were just starting to pick up for this band I was in. He just sort of looked at me like, what a dick. What are you doing that for? You know, but it, um, I think that definitely led into the solo thing that wouldn't have wouldn't have been so strong otherwise and then another career or another signpost was definitely moving to Switzerland and connecting with this Voodoo Rhythm family leaving the Dead Brothers that was a big another one of these things and um, the earthquake that happened here in Littleton was another huge junction point because I just decided that morning uh, I changed my ticket to stay in New Zealand for longer and then this earthquake happened and that just led to so much um, so much stuff with the with the music we made here and a really different approach to songwriting working a lot more with other people and that kind of um, harbour union thing that was formed out of that and also sort of deepening the work me and Marlon were doing. That felt like it all added up. Yeah, sometimes it feels like there's things calling you to junctions and sometimes you just are at junctions and sometimes there's a junction over there if you want to go to it and there'll be a choice but you're not always taking those choices, you know, sometimes you ignore them, you just keep on going, don't take the, uh, don't make a choice, just follow the default setting. I'm never sure about punk, what it means, everybody talks about it as a 15 minute moment for a party that happened in America somewhere and then other people think it was the whole fashion movement from Malcolm McLaren and what that meant and then when you look at it it's just like rock and roll it's the same old thing but a bit a bit more dressed up but then the idea of punk was around before those things happened anyway so I guess it's a misfit the idea of a some angular, sharp, cornered misfit that's a bit dirty, perverse, somehow deformed. and inept but um, convinced, convicted, yeah it has the power of conviction that drives it through its own misfit ineptitude to prove once again that it's not really ability that is important, it's attitude or it's um, bluff or staunching things out or it's a nice concept I always had this thought if I if I stop this tomorrow who would give a fuck no one you know because it's me doing it all myself so it's self-driven self-managed self-motivated and there's not someone else going yeah man this is really cool we're gonna do this tomorrow we'll do that next week we're gonna do that i've got these plans for you next month and we're aiming at this for next year this is me going oh, i wonder if that could possibly happen next year like with me i feel like there's been this success on an artistic level but I see this other place people operate in which is a far more commercial 
commercially successful way they run their business or the way they operate and I part of me wonders about that like if I'm lucky to have not had that in a way and I see that as a, um, it really cuts people down and it, it's too much for a lot of people I had a big talk to a friend of mine in um, Switzerland who was saying they had a big talk with their band there's, there's four of them in it three are brothers and one the drummer's not and he's not related to them so they have families and they do so many gigs a year and if they did any more gigs a year they would have to give up their jobs but to do those to make the money that they would make with their jobs the amount of gigs they would do would have to grow to this much so that would mean they miss out on a whole lot of their family life it would mean a whole lot of pressure it would probably mean the end of the band so for where they are they're in the perfect place they got it exactly as good as it could possibly get without tipping over too far into one side or falling backwards into the other so to know that you are at that place that's perfect for them I wonder about that in relation to me too like I often look at taking on a manager how that would work what that would mean where that would go commercially what that would do to my brand how it would compromise what I would see I had to do or what we would have to start to do to try and lift it to this certain thing and I look at where I'm at and think I can afford to live I've got a house I can live in I've got food I can do what I want mostly it's pretty good and I'm doing what I want so what would you want to change so it's a strange thing I guess everybody builds and builds and wants more and more and that's the way to do it and my other thing is like what's going to happen to me when I get old will I have uh, security to help me stay alive or what support will be there for me out of my my whatever you call that but I don't have a uh, I don't have a superannuation or anything I'm working towards so I don't know will I be able to keep doing this music for as long as I want to ultimately I'd love to be doing it for as long as I can it's not like I'm going to stop when I'm 60 or anything like that